<clears throat> Welcome to the Boardwalk Talk Series at the Estuarium at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber and we are coming to you virtually for the first time with our Boardwalk Talks. Um, so hopefully those of you who are at home tuning in um, will enjoy a little virtual trip to our beach classroom and if you have any um, beach finds that you have previously found and taken home with you please feel free to ask questions about your own beach finds submit pictures and we will try to answer some of the questions about the things that you have collected so um, i'm going to show you some of the things that we have here these are typical items that can be found on our gulf coast beaches we have a lot of things here um, <clears throat> And so we've got some mollusk shells. So these are probably one of the most common things to find on the beach. So we have, I'm gonna grab this as well. And this. So <clears throat> these two are very commonly found on our beaches. Um, and in a minute, I'm going to come back to these two shells. Uh, they're both snails. This, was an, this is an oyster drill snail, and this one is called a moon snail. And um, they both drill holes in other animals' shells. Um, and I have one to show right here. So if you've ever walked along the beach and found a shell with a perfectly round hole in it like that, um, that was likely drilled by one of these two. Um, so they secrete an acid and they can drill through a, the calcium mollusk shell, the um, clam shell, or sometimes they'll even eat others of their own kind. And you could do a little experiment at home if you had a little piece of shell and you put it in a glass of vinegar, even a mild acid like vinegar, you can see dissolving these shells. So you can see um, bubbles coming off of the shell if you put it in vinegar. So a lot of times we find these two shells, these two kinds of shells occupied by a different kind of animal. So I have an assistant over here Let's see if you can find me a hermit crab in there. And Mendel, while you're looking for a hermit crab, um, Bailey News 12 wants to know if we're going to look at any starfish. We are. In fact, I brought a live starfish that we had in a tank here at the estuarium, so I will show you that in a few minutes. So these are hermit crabs. This one is in um, an oyster drill snail shell. So let me do a quick poll. How many of you think that when snails and clams grow, they leave their shells behind? And how many of you think their shells grow with them? What do you think, Noah? Do they leave their shells behind or do they grow with them? They grow with them. Noah is right. So when mollusks grow, their shells grow with them as our bones grow with us. So they hatch from egg cases like this. Um, I've got a selection of different snail egg cases. Um, and they hatch with, with tiny little shells. And as they grow, their shells grow with them. Um, and you can sort of see a growth pattern in this one. This is a lightning whelk. And this would be the oldest point of the shell. These are actually sh uh, shells from baby lightning whelks that washed up an, an egg case like this, washed up on the beach. This is another something that you might find on the beach. And sometimes not all of the babies hatch. And we can open these uh, discs in this egg case and sometimes find the shells of the babies that didn't hatch. So these are baby lightning whelk shells, and so you can see how small they are when they, when they hatch, and you can see the little bump at, the, at the, um, the top end if you point this away from you and look at it. 
and as they grow, their growing edge would be here, and they would spiral outward. So in this one, because the shell is cut away, you can see the central column, that's columella, and you can see how the snail grows. But snails' shells do grow with them. Their bodies are attached to their shells, and um, they can never leave their shells. And when they die, the, the shell is the hard part that's left behind, as some other kinds of animals leave bones behind. And then sometimes hermit crabs move into empty snail shells. So this is one of the animals that we often find at the beach. I'll give it a little water. Now, Mendel, one thing that's <clears throat> interesting is, is there a difference between the hermit crabs that you find at the beach and the hermit crabs that may be seen in a souvenir store? The hermit crabs that we find most commonly on our beaches on Dauphin Island, this one may let you see it a little more. Well, maybe not is a stripe leg hermit crab. If you can get into the water, maybe you can see them a little bit. Um, and th this particular species of hermit crab can't stay out of the water very long. So it can be out for a few minutes, but um, it is not a uh, hermit crab that could stay out of water and just survive, say, with a damp sponge, like some of the ones that you buy at um, pet stores are. So this is a different species and different species have different requirements. So this one requires a saltwater aquarium. Uh, Bailey, who's 12 years old, she asked you, why are some shells broken? They get broken by different processes in the ocean. They might get broken by um, waves pounding them against rocks during storms, or sometimes they are um, crushed by bigger animals that might eat the mollusks inside. Sometimes crabs will eat the snails or animals inside or fish might crush shells to eat the animals inside. So they get broken in different ways. Um, and so we will talk about some of the other things we have besides the mollusks. Though if you have pictures of mollusks and you want to ask about them, feel free. Actually, before we move on from mollusks, because I do remember that somebody had sent a picture that included a shell like this. This is a cockle shell. It is um, from a large clam. So these are, um, you can commonly find these on our beaches. Uh, often they're broken, so a lot of times you find pieces of this one. And that's only half a shell, right, Mendel? There are two, so the clam would have two shells. And while it's alive, the body of the animal is attached to the shell, and it holds the, shell, the two shells together. So as the um, snails are attached to their shells for as long as they're alive, so are the clams and oysters and scallops, some other examples of some mollusks, some bivalves, the ones with two shells are bivalves, like a bicycle has two wheels. So for all of these, they are attached to their shells their entire lives. Um, Thor <coughs> wants to know, do sea stars live under seashells? <clears throat> It depends on the kind of sea star, and they will move around a good bit. Um, I will pull out the sea star since you guys are asking about it. And um, this is the sea star that is most commonly found around Dauphin Island. Although I will say about the sea stars and their relatives, which I'll tell you a little more about in a minute, um, we don't have that many of them around Dauphin Island, although they are commonly found on a lot of beaches. There's a lot of freshwater inflow from the rivers of Alabama. And I'll, I'll come back to that in just a second. I'm gonna pick that sea star back up in just a second, but I'll show you this image. This is the watershed of Mobile Bay. And all of this land area in green drains to Mobile Bay. And then that water a lot of it flushes out between Dauphin Island and Fort Morgan Peninsula, and then the currents in the northern Gulf of Mexico push east to west and push a lot of that 
the fresh water and the salt water are mixed together, but this water is a lot more fresh than the water out in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a lot less salty. We call that brackish water. So that brackish water is pushed along Dauphin Island's beach there, and sea stars and their relatives don't have a very high tolerance for low salinity water. So we don't see as many of these on our beaches as you might find on some beaches. But this is one that we do find here. And I'll flip it over so you can see the underside. So these are little suction cup feet called tube feet. And it can stick to um, the side of the container. It was doing it a, a few minutes ago. So it moves with those suction cup feet. They often will bury themselves at the water's edge. The beach is kind of a hard place for animals to live. The, um, there's not vegetation for them to find shade and shelter. Um, the sun is pretty intense. There's not a lot of shelter from predators. One of the adaptations of animals that live on the beach, and the beach would extend a little bit out into the water. So if you find a sea star at the water's edge, even if it's in the water, that would be considered living at the beach, um, is burrowing. So they are flat and they will um, bury themselves in the sand. This is the mouth of the sea star right here. And what's really neat, Mendel, is we have some of these in our aquarium um, for people to watch um, in their, and they move so slowly as you can, it's kind of cool to watch them as they move around. They do move slowly. They're, um, but see, different sea stars have different life habits also. So some of them um, eat, they scavenge for algae and dead things that they find in the sand. Some of them are active predators. They will eat snails and other slow-moving animals. Uh, some of them will eat coral. So um, there is some fun footage of if you speed sea star movement up, you can see some pretty impressive chase scenes with uh, sea stars chasing down their prey. Uh, Joey, who's eight years old, he asked you, can starfish grow their arms back? They absolutely can. So one of the common characteristics of sea stars and their relatives is that they can regenerate and they're really good at regeneration so the sea star could re theoretically um, if it survived it could theoretically grow back if it only had one-fifth of its body will who's six-year-old wants to know where the eyes are on the starfish these stars don't really have very obvious eyes that I can point out to you, but they have light receptor cells. So they have cells that can pick up light um, so they can tell light and shadow. And actually, as I look at the tip of this sea star, it looks like it may be regenerating the tips a little bit. You can see it. Uh, Kingston, who's 10 years old, wants to know how come there are so many sand dollars on the beaches of Dolphin Island? <laughs> Hi, Kingston. Um, sand dollars are related to sea stars. So I um, will show you one that's, that's relatively whole. And, um, you know, they're one of the shells that wash up, often broken because they're pretty delicate. When the sand dollars are alive, and you don't see many live ones around Dauphin Island, um, but they are covered in really short spines that almost make them look furry and those spines usually fall off after they die um, and this is the mouth of the sea star and so they will push food up these grooves using their little spines and they also have little tube feet the little suction cup feet like sea stars um, and so they eat they also can often be found around beaches just they're not commonly found around our beaches because of the um, low salinity water and they too will bury in the sand. And um, often one of the factors that affects what you find on our beaches and how much you find on our beaches is the um, energy of the waves. So sometimes this is from storm energy. 
Sometimes after a big storm, you get more energy and it, um, larger things, larger shells and more of them are uncovered by the sand and pushed up onto the beaches. Um, and there are other factors as well, um, like different um, barriers. So like the sand island spit that goes out from Dolphin Island. So different factors to what washes up where and when. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the, the energy flow. So from storms and currents, and that will uh, determine what is washed up and what size. Um, one question that we missed a second ago, Bailey wants to know, how long do sea stars live for? Hi, Bailey. Um, I am not sure the answer to that question, actually. But that would be a good, um, good thing for us to look up, and maybe we can find that out and um, add it when we figure it out, add it to the comments. Uh, Julie asks, do, you, do we have a live sand dollar in our estuarium? I think we may not right now. There, I so think, we. I think there's one in that blue thing where we got the. You, you thought you saw a, a live sand dollar? No, I think there is. Oh. Um, but we do have lots of other kinds of live animals. Uh, another couple of which I will show you, and um, we, you know, have sort of a changing cast of of animals that. Um, that we have at the estuarium depend, depending on our um, collection and what is um, turning up in our local area. So I'm gonna show you another live animal and I am going to point out that it's, it would be pretty strange to find this on our beaches, but it does happen. So this is a freshwater turtle. And we have, even recently, so it's not unheard of, it's just, it's a little unusual. Found some um, baby turtles, freshwater turtles, that wash up on our beaches. And we do have people who find them occasionally. Um, and sometimes they recognize them as freshwater turtles and bring them to us. Um, and sometimes people mistake them for sea turtles and put them out in the ocean. Um, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't fare too well out in the Gulf of Mexico if they were put out in the Gulf. But what happens is when we get big rainfalls in the state, as we've had um, this spring, uh, we get all this fresh water flushing down, and, it, and it, it, it has a lot of energy to it when you have a, a big slug of fresh water. And it will sometimes push freshwater animals that uh, live in the delta, in the Mobile Delta, down Mobile Bay, and sometimes they raft on um, floating logs, floating debris, and then when they exit Mobile Bay and they're riding that current, they get pushed up onto Dolphin Island beaches. So it is not unheard of to find freshwater animals alive and also um, vegetation, freshwater vegetation, and um, other things that are, that are being pushed by water down into um, the bay and then onto our beaches. Um, so I will address a question grab this, that we had from Rebecca a couple of days ago. And she didn't have a photograph. She didn't have her uh, phone or camera with her when she saw this, but she described it. And my best guess from her description um, of seeing tracks that were two um, wiggly lines with no obvious footprints. So my best guess from that description is that that might be turtle tracks. So I printed out a picture of turtle tracks. Um, these are sea turtle tracks, but it could also have been uh, diamondback terrapin tracks, which would have been smaller. Um, the turtles are lighter, so they wouldn't have made as deep an impression in the sand. Um, but if it's a little early in the, for, for turtles to be coming up onto the beach and nesting, um, the nesting season usually begins May 1st. But during nesting season, sea turtles do come up onto the beaches, the females do, and lay their eggs, and then they, and then they leave the eggs and go back to the ocean. Um, and the tracks sort of look like um, tractor tracks. 
And if you see anything like this on the beach, uh, we ask that you share that information with um, share, share the Beach Turtle, um, the Turtle Monitors. So this says report a sea turtle emergency, but even if it's not an emergency, if you find tracks, um, they would like to hear about that. And for anyone who might be interested in being trained as a um, volunteer sea turtle monitor, the Share the Beach is conducting their training online right now, and you can find that information here. So Mendel, going back to two quick questions that we had um, on sand dollars. <clears throat> Gage, Seven, and Sawyer, Four, what's to know what eats a sand dollar when it's alive? Hi, Gage. Hi, Sawyer. Um, there aren't that many animals that will eat sand dollars. I'm going to kind of clack this on this shell so you can hear it. So sand dollars are pretty hard, although their shells are brittle and fragile and they will break. But the soft part of the animal, the tissue part, sort of um, permeates through this test. So we call this a test rather than a shell, like an oyster shell. So with the oyster, the tissue part, the soft part of the animal is on the inside of that shell. And if you opened it up, there would you find a piece of tissue, the, the meat, the animal there. The sand dollar is a little different. So the soft tissue parts are kind of all in, incorporated and, and threaded through the hard part. And so that wouldn't be too um, easy to get a, a meal out of this animal without eating a lot of that, um, that hard, hard part. There may be some animals that might eat them, um, especially when they're small, and it may be sort of like incidental, like they may get eaten with other things as an animal might be grazing, maybe something like a sea turtle that would have powerful enough jaws to crunch through them. And one more from Casey, who's nine years old. She wanted to know, how do sand dollars move? Well, they do have those little spines. They're very short. so. This one doesn't have them, but if you can see, I have a magnifying lens. I don't know if that would help. Thank you, Noah. If you can see these little dots on the underside, that is where its little spines were attached. So it has a lot of them covered in little spines. Looks a little fuzzy when it's alive. And it also has these little suction cup feet, like the sea star. You may be able to see those in the sun. So it can move both with its spines, pushing itself around, and with its suction cups. Um, and then let's go back to sea turtles. Uh, Kim wants to know, how long do sea turtles live? Sea turtles can live for a very long time. Um, of course, there, you know, there are um, early deaths, but they can live uh, 50 years or longer. It depends on the species. And another interesting thing to note about turtle lifespans is that it takes a very long time for them to mature um, so that they can lay eggs. So for that reason, um, there's a conservation concern with that because a lot of them will die before they grow old enough to lay eggs. And um, so keeping the sea turtles alive long enough for them to reproduce is, is an important conservation concern. And Laura just wants to say thank you for hosting a virtual field trip for us. Oh, my pleasure. So what do we have next? Okay, a few other things here that are interesting. Um, so I've got these snail egg cases that I already showed. I, I didn't point out what they were, but these are from lightning whelks, the little babies that we get out of here. Um, this one is from the oyster drill, and it does get that name because they drill holes in oysters, so I described how these snails drill holes in other animal shells. I have a different kind of egg case right here. They don't look much like the, you know, bird eggs that we're accustomed to, the ones we hunt at Easter and eat for breakfast, right? But this is an egg case from a, no, can you grab me that picture right there? Skate, which is a fish that is related to um, sharks and stingrays, and they look a lot like stingrays. Thank you. So here is an illustration of a skate and a baby skate curled up inside this egg case. 
And some people are familiar with these and, um, and think of them as shark egg cases. So I will note that there are some sharks in, in other parts of the world that make egg cases that look similar to this. But the, these that we find um, on our beaches, just they happen to come from skates. Those are the, because of the animals that live in our area. And they are also commonly called um, uh, mermaid's purses. That one has eggs in it that's still in there before they die, before that one dies. So this one here appears not to have hatched. Often you'll find them and they have an opening. Well, this one is damaged, but often you'll find them and they have an opening where the, this one's hard to see, but There's it's there. There's a slit in the egg case. And so that would have been where the baby hatched out. Does only one baby come out of it? Um, I believe there's only one baby. Um, so this one does not have that slit where the baby hatched. And what you hear rattling in there is likely the remains of the, of the baby skate that, that didn't survive. Poor baby. Yeah. So what is the difference between a skate and the rays that we have in our tank here? Skates and rays are, are pretty similar. Um, the skates lack the venomous spine that rays have, somewhere around here. Um, they have a more prominent, these are, these are pretty subtle differences, so it's kind of hard to tell. But they have a more prominent cartilaginous ridge right here, sort of like a nose. Um, and they have two dorsal fins. Although some of our um, ray species do have dorsal fins. Someone mentioned um, a, an electric ray. We do have electric rays in our area and they do have dorsal fins. But um, those are some of the general differences between skates and stingrays. Finley and Dylan say hello. Hi Thank Finley, hi Dylan. <laughs> um, okay, so what are some of the other things that you said? So these are kind of interesting. This is kind of an unusual find up here. They're not um, unheard of, but they're kind of unusual. And this one we call a heart bean, and this one we call sometimes a hamburger bean. Um, they are seeds from tropical trees. So these trees would be living and growing in the tropics, and... Um, they would drop their seeds into the water and then usually they would sprout um, somewhere far south of us. They would wash up on a shore and they would sprout south of us. But occasionally these seeds find themselves in currents that carry them all the way up the um, coast of Florida and um, onto our beaches. So they're not going to sprout here because it's not the right climate for them, but they are kind of interesting to find on our beaches once in a while. Kind of cool. Um, I have some bones as well that you might find on our beaches. A little selection of bones here. Um, let's see. This is one that you, or a couple that you might commonly find on our beaches. So before I tell you what they are, I'll give you guys uh, a few minutes to, or a few seconds to think about it. What do you think this is? What, um, I mentioned that they were bone, so what part of the body do you think they might be from? Well, let's put those right next to it, right next to each other, and then let's look at a different one and see if anybody wants to, what people have to say about those guys. And okay, so we'll come back to that and we'll, we'll come back and answer that question. All right, so these are also bones, and they are from a different kind of animal. Um, and Noah, can I hand these to you and let you help us out with a little information, observation? What do you notice about that bone? I think this bone came from a dolphin. You do? What do you notice about it? What could you tell people about that compared to... On this side right here, it has little dots that are poking out. Yeah. And whenever you rub your finger across it, you can feel the bumps. Yeah, that's a good observation. So these right here. 
Um, these bones are very uh, light compared to other bones. So let's put those down for just a second, Mendel. We have a couple of people who have jumped in and they think that those bones you were asking about are a fish spine. They are, and so when you say spine, I am going to guess that you mean backbone. Um, because there are also uh, different kinds of spines that we might find on fish that might be venomous spines. But this, this is a section of a fish backbone. These are vertebrae. So if you could feel on your back and feel the bumps on your backbone, um, each of those is a vertebra. And so this is two vertebrae from a fish. And these are pretty commonly found on the beach. Sometimes we find um, bigger uh, sections of fish skeleton or we might find other parts of fish. This is a fish bone here. I actually have a couple of different, this is from the same kind of fish. Um, and so I'm not gonna make you guess on that one. <laughs> Thanks. So these are skulls from a hardhead catfish and hardhead catfish are also sometimes called crucifix catfish because if you look at the underside of the skull, it looks kind of like a crucifix. So mine are, are, are broken, but uh, this rattling, maybe. Maybe you can hear that. Um, and those are, in this one, the um, bone has been broken and those have come out. But those are called otoliths, O-T-O-L-I-T-H-S, otoliths, or ear bone, or ear stones. So um, they help a fish balance in the water so that it helps the fish know what is up and what is down and whether it's listing to one side or the other. And so they sort of float freely in that cavity inside their skull and help the fish with their balance. Now let's go back to the two long ones because we didn't get to tell them what, exactly what that was. So these very light bones are from a bird. They are from a pelican. These are pelican wing bones. <clears throat> and these bumps <clears throat> that uh, Noah observed on these bones are where their flight feathers were attached. So they have large um, feathers on their wings uh, that, that help them fly and then they would have a different kind of feather around their body, on their backs and on their breasts to keep them warm so they have different kinds of feathers on different parts of their body that would have uh, different functions. All right, so I will tell you about something else. This here is a piece of wood, a piece of driftwood, and you can see that it is full of holes and channels. And the animal that produced this, and you might find the driftwood with holes in it on the beach like this. The animal that produced these holes is called a shipworm. However, shipworms are not worms. They are clams. So they make the calcium shells like other clams. And each clam has a long uh, muscular foot. It sort of looks a little bit like a tongue. The shipworm foot is quite long. And so I would imagine that is probably how they were initially mistaken for worms. Uh, we call them shipworms rather than driftwood worms because these would have posed a pretty big problem for wooden um, vessels. And so they would have had to take measures to protect their ships from being riddled with holes by animals like shipworms and others that make holes in wood, burrow into wood to live in it. Um, oh, and this one right here, this guy right here, I have some. Actually, I should say this girl here. This one's a female. So this is uh, a horseshoe crab. This one's not alive, but we do have live horseshoe crabs here. Is that um, a fully grown horseshoe crab? It is fully grown. 
Oh, so real quick, mm -hmm. Dawn just asked, why is it called driftwood? Well, it's called driftwood um, if it's been drifting in the ocean. So if it's been drifting in the ocean and then it washes up on our beaches, we call it driftwood. So you can see some other evidence that it's been in the water. So this is, this is evidence that it has been in the ocean. Um, you can also see a couple of very small barnacles right there. Um, and sometimes you'll find wood on the beach that perhaps hasn't been drifting in the ocean. We have dunes adjacent to our beaches, and so, you know, that is a land-based source of wood, but a lot of the wood that we find on the beaches has at least drifted through the water um, and gotten some animals that have attached to it or burrowed into it. And so we call that driftwood because of its time drifting in the ocean. And while you grab the um, <coughs> horseshoe crab again, yes, Lori, you're correct. That is the worms the scientists are studying from the underwater forest. That's right. Pretty cool. <clears throat> so this is called a horseshoe crab uh, because of the horseshoe shape of its uh, carapace, the shell here, exoskeleton. Um, but they're not actually crabs. They are only very distantly related to crabs. And they're, they're closely, more closely related to scorpions and spiders, but not very closely related to them either. And sometimes that information leads people to think that they would sting with the tail here. They do not sting with that tail. Uh, they have this kind of bowl-shaped shell that's very good protection for the underside of their body. This is the softer, more vulnerable underside where they have uh, their legs and their gills and their mouth. So the shape of this shell is good protection for the more vulnerable part of their body. But without this tail to use as uh, leverage to flip themselves, um, if they got flipped over, they would have trouble turning over. So that is what they do with that long tail. They do not sting with it. Uh, Bailey asks, what size is a baby horseshoe crab? Baby horseshoe crabs hatch out of shells that are about the size of BBs. So the baby horseshoe crabs are very, very tiny and they molt pretty frequently when crabs and shrimp and horseshoe crabs and insects and scorpions and spiders and millipedes and centipedes and rolly bullies, arthropods, all animals in that group, when they grow, they shed their exoskeletons, they molt. And um, so the baby horseshoe crabs would molt very frequently as they grow. Um, oops, caught. I'm gonna grab some more arthropod. Here, I can just turn right around to you. Um, things that you might find on the beach. Sam, who's nine years old, he wants to know if horseshoe crabs are edible. That is a great question, Sam. I love that question. Um, there are people who eat horseshoe crabs. Um, I will say that horseshoe crabs are pretty tough to get into. So if you look at this animal, you might think that it would have a good bit of meat there, but when you flip it over, you see that you might have been, might have overestimated the amount of meat that was in it. Uh, when you look and you see all those, like this um, shell here, there's a lot of uh, space that's not tissue. And so they don't have that many natural predators because, because of that. So it would be a whole lot of work to get through this hard exoskeleton, this tough exoskeleton. And for the effort, there's not that much meat to the animal. There are animals that will eat them. Um, sharks will eat them. Some animals that have big, powerful jaws. Uh, and especially when they're smaller and they're a little easier to crunch through, their exoskeletons are not um, as, yeah, they're not as thick. There are people who will eat them too, but they're not very commonly eaten in the United States. They are valuable for another reason though. Horseshoe crabs have blue blood. It's copper based, unlike our iron based blood. So our 
Iron-based blood carries oxygen around our bodies. And so they, rather than having iron-based, have copper-based blood. It looks kind of bluish. And it's used in the medical industry. Um, and it's very valuable. So there is a harvesting industry to harvest horseshoe crab blood. Most of the horseshoe crabs survive the process. Um, and so it's sort of like they're donating blood. Are released after they have contributed their blood. This is a horseshoe crab molt. So this one here is a dead horseshoe crab that, that washed up dead. And this is a, this is a molt. So the, the exoskeleton is um, pretty thin on this younger one and the molt. And then we have also some blue crabs here. Um, Cohen asks, what do horseshoe crabs eat? Horseshoe crabs, okay, so this is a pretty big female horseshoe crab. The females get bigger than the males. This is the mouth. And if you could feel these bristles, they feel sort of like the bristles of a toothbrush. So if you can imagine that you chewed your food by taking two toothbrushes and rubbing them together, that's how you chew your food. Um, they generally eat pretty soft food or small things that they can swallow. So maybe um, dead stuff that they find in the sand. Um, if, if they might be able to catch a shrimp, maybe. Um, worms maybe, maybe some small clams that are buried in the sand. They um, spend a lot of their time eating, so they kind of uh, cruise around looking for things that they can eat in the sand. But um, they're pretty opportunistic, which means they can eat, they'll eat what they can find and what they can catch and what they can manage to eat. And then Rowan asks, where's its face? <laughs> um, so this is a pair of eyes here. This here that looks kind of like nostrils is actually another pair of eyes. And so I would say that this is its face, maybe. As it moves through the water, it would move through in this direction. So that would be forward. Of course, this is its mouth under here. So its face looks a little different than other faces you might bring to mind. Um, but I would say that this is its face here. And then Evelyn wants to know, how long do they live? Horseshoe crabs um, can live a, a pretty long time, um, maybe 20 years. So pretty long for a, an invertebrate that, you know, lives out in the wild. Um, so we have, what next? The, I was going to show the blue crabs, and we were talking about molting. Um, so one of the things some of you may be familiar with is uh, softshell crabs. The softshell crabs are not a particular kind of crab, a particular species of crab. It is a crab down here where the most um, prominent species of crab that we eat is blue crab. It's usually going to be blue crab if you're talking about softshell crab. But um, it's not a particular species. It is a crab right after it has molted. So um, those arthropods, the crabs, will grow a new exoskeleton inside the old one. It is a process of growth. So the new exoskeleton is bigger than the old one. It's bigger. But they're not going to molt and then grow a new shell. They have to grow that new shell while, they're still, uh, while they still have their, their old one, smaller one. So it's soft so that it fits inside this smaller um, exoskeleton. And Evelyn's asking, what is molting again? It's when they shed their exoskeleton. So at home, if you've ever found the little um, cicada molts, the little bug molts that you might find stuck to a wooden post or a tree, that is um, a molt of a, an insect that will leave that behind and fly away. It's so, kind of like when you buy new clothes. Yeah. You have to get something that will fit what you're going into. Uh -huh. Or sometimes people are familiar with snakes shedding their skin. So we actually shed our skin too. We just don't do it all at once. So when the crab is ready to molt, they will um, take in water and sort of split for the blue crab. It's this back seam right here. For the horseshoe crab, it's the front. 
and they'll split that open and they will wiggle out of their old exoskeleton and they will be soft for a couple of days before um, their new shell hardens up. So during that time, they can be harvested as um, soft shell crabs for the seafood industry. Ann Collins wants to know, where are horseshoe crabs and blue crabs located in the world? So where's the... Where the range? Find, yeah. Horseshoe crabs are, a, this is sort of an ancient species. And there are four um, living species of horseshoe crabs. Um, only one of them is found in the Americas, and it's found all along the East Coast, along the Gulf Coast, and down into South America. And the other three are found around Japan. And then where do we typically find blue crabs? Blue crabs are pretty common um, in the Gulf and along the Atlantic Coast. Um, and so this is a, a really, um, although, you know, it's a lot of work to get through blue crab exoskeletons, too, to get the meat. Um, a lot of people feel like it's worth it, and they are harvested for seafood and eaten. So when you eat them, you know, you crack open the shells. We also eat, you know, other kind of hard-to-eat food, like crawfish. Um, so we crack open these shells, these hard shells. This, this is pretty hard. Uh, and, and get the meat out of these. So that's a blue crab claw. Some of you may have eaten crab claws. Um, and then we do eat the meat out of the body too, although a lot of that is, is organ and, and uh, tissue that we wouldn't eat. Okay, cool. Anything else to share? Do we have Do any? We have on the beach that we haven't seen? Yeah. How about we got a jellyfish? Oh, we brought a jellyfish to dead show. One. A dead one, yeah. So this one is not alive, it's preserved. So these are pretty commonly seen on our beaches. I do recall somebody asked something about like um, seasonality in what we see at the beach. We do, there is some seasonality with animals. Um, so uh, it kind of depends on the species and their, and their life cycle. Um, but the Jellies, we often see washing up on the beaches, um, and it can be related to the currents and the winds and that energy. So that same kind of energy that pushes other things onto the beach, shells and egg cases and bones, um, can also push jellyfish onto the beach. Jellyfish are not, they're not good swimmers. They're not good at swimming against current, and so if there's a strong current pushing up onto the shore, the jellyfish will often wash onto the shore. Can a jellyfish sting you when it's dead? Bailey's asking. Jellyfish can potentially sting you after they're dead. Um, they have stinging cells that can pop and uh, shoot these little stinging barbs out. I know jellyfish are commonly represented as uh, shocking, like producing an electrical shock on cartoons, but they don't shock. They have these tiny little barbs that are in cells, sort of like a bubble. You could think of it as like a bubble with a little harpoon in it. And if that bubble gets popped, the, you know, the barb can sting you. And jellyfish don't need to think about stinging. So they don't have a brain. They're not, um, you know, they're not, they don't have to actively sting. So if something brushes against those stinging cells and pops those cells, they can be stung. So for a while, at, even after they're dead, if they've washed up on the beach, those cells can still pop. Uh, unless they've been washed around in the sand a lot and all of the cells have popped or unless they start to decay, to rot, and the cells are then degraded so that they're not going to pop. But for a, for a while, they can potentially sting. And talking about jellyfish, there may be some that where you see like little blobs on the beach that wash up, are those stinging jellies or is it? A lot of the jellyfish that we have in our local area have um, a sting that wouldn't even be perceptible to us. So um, I they- think, I think at a different beach, there was like a row of jellyfish all washed up on the beach 
That you happens know, sometimes. So one time I got stung by a jellyfish. Oh, that's terrible. Um, so that's a pretty common experience, getting stung by jellyfish. Um, and some of the, the um, remedies would be meat tenderizer or um, running hot water on it or you might take a, if you have a card, like a, an ID or a credit card or something, and scrape across to lift the tentacle off of you without popping any more of those stinging cells into your skin. But yeah, or vinegar. Sometimes people treat it with vinegar. So pretty um, common experience at the beach. Another factor that might contribute to the abundance of the jellyfish is if we have um, big rain events, especially in the spring when there may be fertilizers going on to crops and we have a lot of nutrients being flushed out into the ocean um, that would feed the food of jellyfish. We might have a bloom of algae um, and then that would feed the jellyfish and cause uh, you know um, the jellyfish to reproduce and be more abundant and we might see more jellyfish during different times of the year and, and we also might see them on the beach during different times of year related to um, the energy that might be pushing them onto the beach. Well Mendel, thank you. Um, why don't you tell our folks about Boardwalk Talks and what we're hoping to do in the next couple weeks? So this program, our Boardwalk Talks program, is usually held here at the lab where people join us. The talks are free, they're open to the public, um, and we usually have them first and third Wednesdays of the month. Of course, right now, um, we are not open to the public, and so we are bringing them to you virtually. Um, but when we reopen, we would love for you to come down to the Estuarium and join us for our Boardwalk Talks on the first and third Wednesdays of each month. And you can find our schedule on our website. Mendel, thank you so much. Yeah, and if one people one have thing. any questions, they can reach out to you for them, correctly? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.